everyone who thirsts, come to the waters, come and eat. Listen to Last week I did a couple short teachings on the book of Galatians. They were overview teachings and I put them up on YouTube on Sunday and we've had a few hundred people watch them, that's kind of neat. And I was amazed, uh, God, and I haven't checked today, but a lot of thumbs up. And I wasn't sure uh, what, to, what would happen when I did that, but I really didn't care. But it was interesting. Um, and so this week, I, I brought a helmet because uh, it's one of my helmets. And um, one of these helmets I wear. And uh, I got these safety glasses because I, I'm not expecting anything from anybody out here because this is a friendly congregation. Uh, at least I hope it is. As far as I know, it is. Unless there's something down deep <laughs> that I don't know about, some of you guys. But, but um, and I got these safety glasses because you never know. Uh, something might come flying at you when you get into these uh, sacred cow uh, passages in the, um, especially the book of Galatians, which is the one that people, the Christians, the Christian theologians and Christian folks like to use. If any book of the Bible, it's this one to try to prove that Paul did away with the Torah, the law, the law, the law. You know, this freaky thing, all oh, the law, all oh, the law, you know, like Dracula in the Dracula movies. And, and, and it's just this, this terrible thing in some people's minds. This law, the law of Moses, oh, it's against us. We're under this curse and all this stuff. And, uh, and I want to attack some of those sacred cows. We're going to do it in a very positive way. Um, we're not going to do it like one guy I know, and I bless him. He wrote a 600-page book on the book of Galatians. I have it in my library. I never read it. 600 pages. It's like, I guess that would be a good one to use if you're doing a college class on the book of Galatians. I'm not doing a 600-page book. Honestly, I don't have the heart for it. Um, I've got a few books to publish, but none of them are that long. I honestly believe that brevity is, is the mother of wit and, well, you might not believe it <laughs> if you listen to my teachings, but when it comes to the book of Galatians, I believe we can skim over the top of the waves and really get to the kernel of it very quickly. Uh, last week I did a 23 minute teaching on uh, basically I called Understanding the Book of Galatians in 23 Minutes. People seem to like that video. I guess the shorter the sweeter, but anyway, this one's going to be a little bit longer than that, but I'm going to go through the first three chapters, part one and part two. We will uh, go through uh, next week, Yah willing, uh, the last three chapters, four, five, and six of Galatians. It's really very simple. It's not complex. Last week I did, I basically showed that the book of Galatians is not addressing the validity of Torah or not. That's not the, that's not the point of the book of Galatians all yet. That, this is how the Christian church has made it. It's addressing whether you need to be circumcised in order to be saved, or by extension, whether you need to do the works of the Torah in order to be saved. And Paul makes it very clear there, and in Ephesians chapter 2 and Romans chapter 6, or Romans chapter 4, that salvation is by grace through faith. By the grace of Yehovah Elohim, through faith in Yeshua the Messiah. Or if we want to take it back to Abraham, through faith in Elohim at that time, which was the pre-incarnate Yeshua. And that, 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 that equation has never changed. But as Paul brings out in Ephesians chapter 2, we're saved by 6, or verse 8, we're saved by grace through faith, and then you read a couple verses later, unto good works. Now this may freak a few people out, but I don't care. The truth of the Bible is the truth of the Bible. You're saved by grace through faith, 
And the evidence of your salvation isn't the confession of your mouth or because somebody put you down on a, on a card somewhere because you said the sinner's prayer or this kind of thing. But it's the fruits of your life. Yeshua said, by their fruits you shall know them. So if you say that you're saved, then show me. Don't tell me. Show me and what are the fruits of your life. Well, Yeshua said, if you love me, keep my commandments. We've been over this many times. I'm just reviewing this for the sake of maybe those who haven't heard these teachings. And I'm, before I get into this Galatians uh, uh, commentary, uh, I want to just uh, tag some of these bases. And so the fruits of your life are obedience to Yehovah. What is that? Well, most Christians will agree with this. You don't murder. You don't steal. You don't lie. You don't commit adultery. You don't fornicate. You don't worship idols. You don't take God's name or Elohim's name in vain. You don't rape. You don't do witchcraft. You don't do these things. And you love him and, and you know, try to do the right thing. And you love your neighbor as yourself. Most Christians could agree with that. Hello, that's the law of Moses. Light bulbs going on in the brain. That is what the law of Moses says to do. So if you are a born again Christian and you have this antipathy against the law of Moses, if you are doing those basic things, you are following the commandments in the Torah, in the law of Moses, starting with the Ten Commandments on. So why this logical disconnect that we're against the law of Moses, it's against us and all this stuff, the people twist the scriptures, and yet we know we shouldn't murder and steal and we need to honor our parents and so forth and so on. That's the law of Moses. This may come as a great shock to some people who have never read the Old Testament or the Torah. But that is the law that Paul was talking about and that Yeshua and all the apostolic writers and throughout the Bible are talking about. Where the rub comes is the Sabbath, the biblical feasts, and the dietary laws. And I'm telling my Christian brothers and sisters, guys, Yeshua did that. The apostles did those things. So you're already, whatever Torah commandments you're following that is the law, you're being a good person, you love Elohim, you're not taking his name in vain, you know, if you know what it is, it's not God or Jesus, it's Yehovah, some people say Yahweh, or, and it's Yeshua, but whatever. You know, you're doing the best you can to honor his name and, 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 and you're, you're, you're living a good moral life. That's loving Elohim with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and your neighbors as yourself to the best of the ability, according to the light that you have. And I'm saying, now it's time to come to the next level. And so this is what Paul is dealing with in the book of Galatians, which I covered in my previous teaching. And the, he ends up with the book of Galatians. I'm giving a quick overview. Ends up at the book of, in chapter 5, where he says, walk in the Spirit. Well, I'm just a spirit-led Christian. I don't need the law. Well, what are the fruits of the Spirit? What are the work, works of the, of the flesh? The fruit of the Spirit is how to love you of all your Elohim with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and your neighbors yourself. If you walk in the fruit of the Spirit, you will be fulfilling the Torah. That's how you love your neighbor. And if you work, walk in the, the, if you do the works of the flesh, all those things are proscribed or, or, or um, prohibited in the Torah. Witchcraft, drunkenness, adultery, these kinds of things. Hatred. Those things are all, the, the, the law of Moses says don't do those things. So if you follow the spirit of Elohim, you are naturally going to love Yeshua, love Elohim, and you're going to want to do what he said to do. And you're going to be doing those things. That's the greater message of the book of Galatians. Okay. Also in my other video on the book of Galatians that I made, I didn't even get into the book of Galatians. I gave the contextual background of the book of Galatians. We've got to understand scriptures in its context. And I showed how 
Paul said, imitate me as I follow Yeshua. And Yeshua, follow, Yeshua followed the Torah. He was Torah obedient. Obviously, he was our Savior. If he violated one Torah law, then he was a sinner and he's not our Savior. So we know he followed it. He obeyed it. He was perfect without sin. Sin is a violation of the Torah. And Paul said, imitate me as I imitate Yeshua. And then we went to see how Paul advocated Torah obedience. Do we make void the law by, by grace? Elohim forbid, he says in Romans chapter 3 and other places. And we went to the book of Acts. It shows where he, right up until his, right before his death, he was Torah obedient. He advocated Torah obedience and he promoted it. Okay. So we're going to continue from that point on. And what I'm giving you now, these notes are on my blog right now. They, I put them up a week ago. These notes are on my blog. So as we go through, quickly skim over the waves of the first three, first three chapters of Galatians, the notes are on the blog. I would encourage you to go there. Go to hoshanarabah.org. Uh, most of you know how to get there. It's on the camera or on the video. I'll put it, the website on the video. And you can go there, click on the YouTube channel for the video of this and the previous videos or on my blog and you will scroll down and the notes are all there. I write out my notes and I put them up there so you can study these things to see if what we're saying is true. Prove all things, hold fast that which is good. Be a good Berean. Study these things out. And that way then you'll be able to give an answer for the hope that lies within you. When somebody comes up to you and throws one of these verbal missiles at you against why, why you shouldn't follow the Torah. And you will be able to instruct them, hopefully if their minds and hearts are open, into the truth. Amen. So, first of all, let's, um, let us... Um, Turn to Galatians chapter 1. And this is going to be an open Bible kind of a thing. And again, we're going to try to... Uh, I don't have a lot of notes. I can get through this hopefully pretty quickly. Um, and I will do my best. So, in Galatians chapter 1, like I say, we're skimming over the waves. I need another one of these so I can keep my... I'm one of these guys that needs a big desk. <laughs> my desk is big. I got lots of stuff on it. I like to spread my books out and stuff. Okay, so I'm going to put my Bible over here and my notes on this one so that we don't lose our place. Let's kind of do it like this. There. Good. I think that'll work. Hopefully. We'll do our best. So, Galatians... Let's first of all, Galatians, I'm not going to read through all these. I will touch on some highlights. But Galatians chapter 1, verses 6 through 10. Paul is opening up his epistle, and he's, he's just like getting right to it, getting right to it. And he just says, how have you turned away to the you Galatians to a different gospel? You've turned to another gospel, a different gospel message. He says that in chapter six, uh, verses six and seven. He is so vexed by this, so irritated, so angry. He pronounces in verses eight and nine a double curse on those who are preaching this other gospel. A double curse. If anyone preaches verse. Uh, nine, any other gospel to you than, than, uh, than what you have received, let him be cursed. And he mentions in verse 8, he says, says that again, the first time. Now, some of your Bibles, I'm just going to touch on this point very quickly. Uh, my New King James Bible says, verse 6, I marvel that you are turning away so soon from him, Yeshua, who called you in the grace of Messiah to a different gospel, which is not another gospel, but there, but there are some who trouble you. Wait, wait, hang on, I got. Oh, where am I here? Oh yeah, 
let me read this again. I marvel that you are, verse 6, that you are turning away so soon from him who called you in the grace of Messiah to a different gospel, which is not another, but there are some who trouble you. This is very confusing language. It's a different gospel, but not another gospel. Um, this is not a good translation. There are two different Greek words. I'm not going to get into it. You can go get the notes online. But one is heteros and one is alos. Two different Greek words. And um, I, I, I went in and read what the lexicon said. And let me just say that um, there are some other translations that are better than the King James and the New King James. For example, the Revised Standard Version says, I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Messiah. Well, they say Christ, but I say Messiah. And turning to a different gospel, not that there is another gospel. That's one way that they translate those, those two words. The NIV says, I am astonished that, there are so, that, that, that you are so quickly... So quickly deserting the one who called you by, by the grace of Messiah and are turning to a different gospel, which is really no gospel at all. The, can, the complete Jewish Bible, David Stern's translation says, I am astonished, I'm astounded that you are so quick to remove yourself from me, the one who called you by the Messiah's grace, and to turn to some other supposedly good news, which is not news at all. And then William and Robert Mounts, uh, they're, the, uh, 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 they're a father and a son team. They're some of the leading Greek scholars in North America. When I took a class in, uh, a college class in Koine Greek for a year, uh, we used uh, Robert Mounts' textbook, which is the one that's, the main one that's used in uh, seminaries and Bible college all around the world around the United States at least, in about two-thirds or three-fourths of the seminar, seminaries on basic biblical Greek. Well, together, the father and son have written, have done a, um, what they call the Greek-English interlinear. It's a Bible with Greek, and it's got the uh, English interlinear. And this is how they translate it. Uh, this is directly from the Greek. I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you by the grace of Messiah, they say Christ, and are turning to a different gospel, not that there is another gospel. So, basically what Paul is saying is, the difference between alos and eteros is qualitative versus quantitative, and I forget which is which, I have it all in my notes, I'm not going to get bogged down in that. But he's saying, here, here's a, another gospel, but it's effective, here, it, it appears to be the same gospel, it's one that looks the same, but qualitatively, it's different. That's basically what he's saying. And what is this, God, what is this other gospel? Well, we will, we will get into that and discuss that. Let's skip down to Galatians 1, verses 11 through 21. Again, we're skimming over the waves. Galatians 1, 11 through um, to 21. The gospel message Paul was teaching was the same as the other apostles, such that they glorified him regarding Paul. So Paul, remember Paul was saved on the road to Damascus. He then was, was, went out into the wilderness, uh, Arabian Peninsula for several years, and where he, we don't have a lot of information, but he seemed to have been, had an, a, a divine encounter with Yeshua, the Messiah, and he was instructed. And then after a number of years, he came back, and eventually he, they teamed him up with, um, well, I think it was Barnabas. And then later on, they had a division and it went with, he went with Silas. But it, first of all, it was Barnabas and um, Paul. And eventually, after a number of years, it was Paul and, well, then it was Paul and Silas. And so Paul was a junior partner because they didn't know what to do with him because he had been the one killing and persecuting believers. And yet they had heard that he had gotten saved. So anyway, over after a few years, and you can go read that, he goes back to Jerusalem to compare notes. He had been preaching the message of the gospel to the Gentiles and, and to the Jews, anybody would listen. And he compared notes with what he was preaching, what he received from Yeshua as a one who was out of season or out of time because he, he encountered Yeshua after the other apostles did. And he compared 
his notes with him, so to speak, what he was preaching. And it says here in verse 24 of chapter 1, it says, And they glorified Elohim in me. In other words, they saw the other apostles, the main apostles, or the original apostles, saw that what Paul was teaching was the same message that they were teaching and that Yah was opening up the doorway and producing to the Gentiles and producing great fruits. So basically, he's teaching the same thing that they were teaching. Now, now that's chapter 1. That wasn't too difficult, was it? And God, Galatians really is not a difficult book. And we're going to try to keep it pretty simple. Let's go to Galatians chapter 2. Remember, we're only going through chapter 3, so this isn't going to take too terribly long. Galatians 2, 3, 3 through 5. Now, Paul begins to get down to the ess essence of the issue. He introduces the idea of circumcision. Let's read verse 3. Yet not, e not even Titus, who was with me, being a Greek, so he would have been born uncircumcised, was compelled to be circumcised. Titus was Paul's assistant. He was not compelled to be circumcised. And this occurred because false brethren... Oh, um... um False brethren secretly brought in, who came in by stealth to spy out our liberty, which we have in Messiah Yeshua, that they might bring us into bondage. See, people will read this who don't understand what's going on and say, See, the law tells you you need to be circumcised, and it's bondage. And therefore, the whole Torah is bondage which is patently ridiculous and illogical and is contrary to the scripture and contrary to what, what most Christians even believe because they do believe in a lot of the Torah law. They just have a hard time with the Sabbath, the dietary issues and the biblical feasts and a few other things that they don't know about because they haven't studied it. Like beards and seats and getting, you know, different things like that. So Paul is bringing up the idea of circumcision. Well, what was the deal with circumcision? Well, all we have to do is go to Acts 15, verse 1. Acts 15 is where the first Jerusalem council occurred, the apostolic council. And what was the issue there? What was the issue in Acts 15? Let's turn there real fast. It wasn't about whether the Torah was valid or not, whether Gentiles should keep the Torah or not, that's not the issue. The issue was, verse 1, And certain men came down from Judea and taught the brethren, Unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. And then verse 5 follows up, But some of the sect of the Pharisees who believed rose up there. These were people that were Pharisees that believed that Yeshua was the Messiah. They were believers. Rose up saying, it is necessary to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses. So the issue here was you've got to be circumcised in order to come into the synagogue. This is what the Pharisees taught. You cannot come into the synagogue and partake and be part of this unless you are circumcised. And so because a lot of the believers were still hanging out in the synagogue until they eventually got kicked out. They just kind of took some of these protocols over. And because this is the Pharisees were like the super righteous, spiritual, most knowledgeable about the Bible, people weren't going to question what they said. So when they came into the Christian church, they brought this tradition with them. You've got to be circumcised. As I said last week, this was a hard pill to swallow. Paul is out there preaching to the Gentiles, and you got these other guys out there preaching also to the Gentiles, saying, you can't be part of our group, our elite little club, unless you're circumcised. You can't even come in here. You cannot, you're teaching them this wonderful message of the gospel, and then they're saying, but you got to be circumcised first. That's a huge stumbling block. If you're a man and you weren't circumcised as a baby and you hear the message of the gospel about how Yeshua came 
to forgive you of your sins and, and, and give you this wonderful message. And you grab onto it. All of a sudden, somebody meets you at the door and says, uh, pull your pants down, pops. Um, I want to see if you're circumcised. If not, well, we can take you in a back room here and take care of it right now. I mean, just to put yourself in the cultural context of that. That's kind of a stumbling block. That's why Paul was fit to be tied. That was the issue. That was the main issue. And on top of it all, you got to be walking in the Torah and do all of this before you even walk in the door. That too is a stumbling block. Look, you got to catch the fish, fish first and then you clean them up. Everybody that walks in that door is not going to be perfectly walking in the Torah. I'm not. You're not. It's hypocritical and arrogant to say that we are. We're doing the best that we can. So this is the issue here. And of course, the Jerusalem Council ruled that, look, they do not have to be circumcised to come in. And they don't have to be walking perfectly in the Torah. Look, Torah is something you grow into. You've got to learn it little by little. And as you come into it, you adjust your life accordingly. We've got to be merciful and gracious to people just coming to a knowledge of the truth. Like I say, you catch the fish and then you clean the fish. We don't do the cleaning. It's actually the Ruach HaKodesh. It's the spirit of Elohim that does the cleaning. As the Ruach convicts the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment, as Yeshua said that the Comforter would do. It's not our job. Our job is to preach the truth, preach the gospel, and love people and help them when they want it and let them come little by little into the knowledge of these things. Trust me, if somebody walks in that door off the streets, Yah has led them, they're either going to shape up or ship out. All, I got, all we have to do is just keep preaching the word, preaching the truth in love, and they're either going to see it and get it and, and want to follow it, but our beating them over the head with it, being a Torah terrorist, and trying to cram it down their throat, and tell, trying to bring them up to our great high standard of righteousness, isn't going to work it. You didn't, you didn't come to it that way, did you? I didn't come to it that way. Well, I was born into it, but then I walked away from it for a few years and I came back. And it wasn't somebody beating me over the head because I was violating the Sabbath that brought me back into it. It was the drawing of the Ruach. So we want to provide a, a loving atmosphere here. But we can't let anybody and everybody walk in the door because as the Jerusalem Council said, if somebody walks in this door with a big ham roast and plops it down on our kosher potluck table, that's a problem. So that's why they said, you know, no unclean meat because we don't let that in here. That's an abomination. And nobody that's walking in open sexual sin. If you're an adulterer, a fornicator, or a homosexual, or something else, and you walk in here and we find out about it, we're going to walk you right back out. But well, first of all, we're going to talk to you and find out where you're at. And we're going to work with you. And if you're still struggling with it and you haven't overcome these things, then you can't come in here because it'll pollute the, the family atmosphere. We've got little children. We've got all kinds of things. We don't want your demons coming in here. But we will work with you behind the scenes if you truly want to overcome those things. And we will help you and love you. Amen. And those are several of the things, you know, that they, they were dietary issues and there were sexually moral issues and I had some idolatry issues, which don't maybe totally pertain to us today, depending on how you interpret them. But that, that's what it was. That's what they said in Jerusalem Council. And they said, and let the people slowly learn the law of Moses and they will learn how to walk in righteousness, how to love Yeshua by keeping his commandments. Okay, so much for Acts 15. Let's go back to Galatians. So we see in Galatians 2, 6 through 10, that the other apostles accepted the message of the gospel that Paul was preaching to the Gentiles. And for them, circumcision wasn't an issue. Um, Paul says here, verse 6, but from those, but from those who seem to be something, that's the other apostles, whatever they were, it makes no difference to me. Elohim shows personal favoritism to no one. For those who seem to be something, they added nothing to me. 
In other words, he was preaching the whole truth, the same truth they were preaching. But on the contrary, when they saw that the gospel for the uncircumcised had been committed to me as the gospel for the circumcised was to Peter, and when um, and he and so forth and so on, verse, skip down, verse 9, it's a parenthetical. And when James and Peter or Cephas and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that had been given to me, they gave me, they gave me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship. Paul was not preaching an anti-Torah message. That we should go to the Gentiles and they to the circumcised. They desired only that we should remember the poor, the very thing which I also was eager to do. So Paul was not preaching against the Torah. If he had been, it would have scandalized the apostles, the other apostles. It was this issue with circumcision. Now, reading a little bit further, Paul has a little butting little heads. He butt heads with Peter. And he confronted Peter and called him a hypocrite. Because Peter was reverting to some non-biblical Jewish traditions that the Pharisees adhered to. Now, I'm not going to go into a long discussion about the Pharisees. There were not very many Pharisees in the time of Yeshua. There were only a few thousand out of hundreds of thousands. It was a very small and elite group of people. And then there was, and I, I don't remember now, I'd have to go back and do some research. I've written about this. But there were like five or eight levels of a Pharisee. You had the initiate, and then you could work your way up and pass the test till you became a Pharisee of the Pharisees like Paul was. He was a top level, top dog Pharisee. And they, they had scrupulous, punctilious, there's a good word for you, um, levels that you had to attain to. Involved holiness, righteousness, tithing, um, ritual cleansings, all kinds of things. Some of them were related to obedience to the Torah. Some of them were man-made things like how to wash your hands and how to, you know, all kinds of things. If you want to look at rabbinic Judaism today, that'll give you a good idea of what they did. Okay? Because rabbinic Judaism is, they're the ones, they have continued rabbin, uh, the Pharisaical tradition down to this age. A lot of extra traditions that they add in there that are non-biblical. And in this case, they did not eat with Gentiles because they did not, they didn't even touch Gentiles. Remember the parable of the Good Samaritan? The priest and the Levite, they all went to the opposite side of the road. They wouldn't touch that guy, that poor, um, whatever he was, heathen or whatever down in the gutter. It was a Samaritan came along. Remember Yeshua, Yeshua, when he talked to the woman at the well, the um, uh, Samaritan woman, she was shocked that he would even talk to her. Much less take a cup from her of water that she had touched. There was a, that was apartheid. That was segregation. And so when Peter got around a bunch of Jews that kind of tended in that direction, they were believers, and they would not eat with the Gentiles that had gotten saved, Peter kind of like swung this way and sided with these Jews that were still into this apartheid racist thing. And... Paul, who, who was the, gen, the apostle of the Gentiles and saw the mighty work that Yah was doing among the Gentiles. I mean, Peter should have seen this because Peter was the one had the vision of the sheep coming down in Acts chapter 10 where Yah said, whatever Elohim is considered common and unclean, you know, it is now clean. And he saw that all these animals on the sheep was a metaphor for the Gentiles. Peter, of all people, should have known that, that the gospel and the spirit was going to the Gentiles now as well as to the Jews. Remember, Yeshua told them to go to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the world. That was the fulfillment of the last command that Yeshua gave them in Acts chapter 1 before he ascended to heaven. But Paul pulled away from that, or Peter did, and he went, swung back over to this apartheid segregation thing, and Paul countered him on it and called him a hypocrite. And Paul was right. 
So they were learning to, they were learning to pull down the wall of middle partition, the soreg, that, that Paul talks about in Ephesians chapter 2. They were learning to pull it down. They had to get past these cultural things that they had been raised with where you don't even talk to Gentiles or have anything to do with them. And Yah was pulling the middle wall of partition, so it was kind of a messy business. And, and, and Paul was, was the one banging that wall down. He talks about that in Ephesians chapter 2. There's, they call it the one new man. There's neither Jew or Gentile, but all are one in Messiah. All part of the commonwealth of Israel, all part of redeemed Israel, or what he says in Galatians chapter 6, the Israel of God, or we could call it spiritual redeemed Israel. It doesn't replace the Jews. We're not into replacement theology. It just says that everybody, including the Jews the, from the tribe of Judah and Benjamin and all the other tribes, have to come to the Messiah, and they're the ones that are the true Israelites, the true children of Abraham. And Paul mentions that numerous times in the book of Romans, three times in the book of Galatians, three alone, or four actually. Moving right along. So, um, again, the issue was circumcision. And the issue was not about whether the Torah is valid or not. But whether one had to be circumcised in order to be, uh, in order to, uh, and obey the Torah in order to be you know, granted initial salvation or redemption. Now in Romans chapter 4, that's the, Paul's discussion of Abraham. And there Paul discusses the model for salvation going clear back to the Abrahamic covenant and the example of Abraham. How many of you know what age Abraham was? when Yehovah brought him out of Babylon, or what we might call Babylonia. He was 75. And he, it was accounted to him for righteousness sake because he believed Elohim and he left the New York City of that day and went to Wagon Tire, always called Wagon Tire, Montana. I don't know if there is such a place, but in other words, it was Hicksville over there in the land of Canaan. Abraham was wealthy. He was, a mighty, he was a mighty prince. He was, a, he was a, a military genius. When he came to the land of Canaan, they respected him and they feared him. The Canaanite kings. And E. Pharaoh did. He, was, he, left, he left a well-heeled, respectable position and he went to the backwoods. And that was the faith him doing that, that was faith in Elohim and leaving the world. And Yah counted that to him for his righteousness sake. So he left when he was 75 years old. How would you like to be 75 years old and be told to pick up stakes and take your whole family and move? Well, it was about 600 miles away, but in those days it may, have been, may as well have been on the other side of the globe. You know what I mean? When they traveled by camel or, or, or donkey or walked. So, now how many of you know how old Abraham was when Yehovah told him to, be, to circumcise himself and be circumcised? He was 99. It was 24 years later after Yehovah pronounced Abraham righteous. In other words, you have right standing with me. So obviously circumcision is not, is not a salvational preconditional requirement. And this is what Paul is trying to say in Romans chapter 4. You are saved by grace through faith, not by works. Does that invalidate the Torah? No, it just says you cannot be saved by Torah obedience because you can never keep it good enough in order to be saved. Because if you violate one commandment, you've now brought the death penalty on yourself. I'm getting ahead of myself here. We'll talk about that in a minute. Book of Galatians is not about whether Torah is valid or not. In fact, it says in a couple places that in the book of in um, uh, well Genesis twenty-eight, I think it's verse six, and a few verse chapters later that Moses was Torah obedience. Torah obedience was the fruit of his righteousness and his act of faith of his devotion to Jehovah. It's a fruit.
So the question of the book of Galatians is, should circumcision be brought into the, that was practiced in the synagogue? And let me just say this. Today, if you want to go join an Orthodox synagogue, and we've got a few here in our area, if you want to become a member, guess what? You've got to be circumcised. Well, I'm already circumcised. Well, they're going to do it again. They can't really do it again, but they're going to do their little ceremony where a little drop of blood is brought out, and, and now it's okay. The circumcision that your pediatrician did or whoever when you were a baby or whatever isn't good enough for these, these people. I think it's sick. I think it's sick. Personally. Tradition of men. And if circumcision, as I said last week, was a precondition for salvation, sorry ladies, you're out of luck. You can't ever get saved because you can't be circumcised. <laughs> Obviously it's not a precondition for salvation. Now I understand in Exodus 12 it says anybody who is circumcised, who is not circumcised, cannot keep Passover. Okay? Look. We're not going to get into that discussion. And that's where the Jews probably got it from as a condition for salvation. But obviously, circumcision was not a, uh, even at that time, was not a precondition for salvation because the Israelites were not circumcised, as far as we know, when the death the messenger of death passed over, the blood from the lamb was put on the doors, and they went into their house on Passover evening. That was not, save it, save it for later, I'm filming this. That was not a precondition. I don't want to get sidetracked on this, we can talk about it later, but, and I want to hear what you have to say. But it was not a precondition. Now, does that mean for salvation, because they were, the model was they were saved when they were in that room. Everybody outside their houses, the firstborn all died. That's the model. Now, does that mean that circumcision is invalid? No. Circumcision was a sign of the Abrahamic covenant, and it's, it's a level of righteousness. In fact, in Ezekiel it says, nobody, and if that's a millennial prophecy, there in Ezekiel, I think it's 44, it says, nobody who is uncircumcised will minister in the temple in the millennium. So, Obviously, it is a level of righteousness. And I, I, if you want to go to the higher level in your spiritual walk, then it's a good, if you're a man, it's a good thing to be circumcised. But it's not, a, it's not an entry level requirement. It's a higher level of righteousness, okay? That's all I'm gonna say on that. If you, some of you may have some, some good comments, we'll come back to that. We'll, we'll have a chance afterwards. And please hold on to those. I wanna hear what you have to say. So, So the question should be, should this tradition of man, that is, in other words, you need to be circumcised to become a part of the church or synagogue, be brought over from the Jewish religious system and adopted into the Christian church? That was the other gospel, as I see it, that was the other gospel that Paul was saying should not be brought in. That was the other gospel that he was against. That was the other gospel. It's a different gospel. He, and he was, he was adamantly opposing this. And again, it was never an issue whether Torah was a standard of righteousness that believers should follow or not. After they have received their initial salvation, justification, or redemption. I could define each of those terms that we're not going to. We're skimming over the waves here. You see, as I just mentioned, the Torah teaches that circumcision was a sign of the Abrahamic covenant. Never, and it was never a condition for receiving Elohim's favor or his grace. Otherwise, Moses or Abraham was out of grace for 24 years with Elohim before he was circumcised. But the scripture says that after he left Babylon, it was accounted to him for righteousness sake. So he wasn't out of grace. Can't have it both ways. So circumcision is something that you did because you were saved or because you, you were accepted of Elohim, not to get saved or to be accepted by Elohim. That's an important distinction, distinction. Let me say this again. It was circumcision was something you did because you were saved or because you were accepted by Elohim, not 
to not the, you, it wasn't something you did to get saved or to get accepted by Elohim, to get right standing or what we call justification. So we might say, in other words, Torah obedience is a result of salvation, not a precondition for it. Therefore, man is not saved by the works of the Torah, but by faith in Elohim, who then pours out his unconditional love and grace upon the person who has inclined his heart to repent of his sins, which is or Torah violation of Torah, and obey Yehovah. This is the Abrahamic covenant model for receiving salvation from Elohim, as Paul teaches it in Romans chapter 4. Now let's get over to Galatians chapter 3, and this is where it really gets kind of a little hairy, but it's not that really that bad. So therefore, Galatians 3, 1 through 9, having established these basic truths about salvation by grace through faith, and, and circumcision is not a requirement, Paul goes on to explain that the works of the law can't save a person. Is he saying, don't do them? No. He's saying, is he saying, well, you, can't, you don't need to follow the Torah, so it's all, all right to go out now and commit adultery, break the Sabbath, uh, eat a, a pig, uh, murder, steal, dishonor your parents? No. He's not saying that at all. He's just saying, you can't do them in order to get saved. Doesn't mean you shouldn't do them. It says you can't use them as a, because nobody can live up to it perfectly. If you just break one of them, you violate the Torah and the death sentence the wages of sin is death has now come on you. And this is the same model we follow today. We are saved by grace as Abraham was through faith. Galatians, that's Galatians 1. He says, oh foolish Galatians. Sometimes I get taken to task for being a little spicy in my language. You know what the word foolish means? It only means stupid or brain dead. Look it up in the Greek. He didn't pull punches. There's some things that are just flat out stupid. You gotta be. You gotta be. It literally means mindless or stupid. You got. You gotta believe. He says, "Oh, foolish Galatians." He says, "Who has bewitched you?" It's like a different spirit. The word bewitch, you look it up in the Greek, it means different things. But one of the things is you've come under the spell of something. I call it a doctrine of a demon. A demonic influence. If you believe some of these other, other gospels. We've got to be careful. We've got to stick with the truth and read what they're saying and read it in this context. Galatians 3, 10 through 12. What's this one say? Those, let's read this one. 3, 10 through 12. For as many as are of the works of the law, in other words, you believe you're going to be saved by your good works, are under the curse. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who does not continue in all the things which are written in the book of the law. That, but that no man, that no one is justified by the law in the sight of Elohim is evident, for the just shall live by faith. Yet the law is not of faith, but the man who does them shall live by them. So those who think that their good works of Torah beneath can save them or justify them, that is to bring them into right standing with Elohim, have now put themselves under the curse of the law. Look, the law is not a curse unless you disobey it. Money is not evil unless you love it. A gun is not evil unless you use it to harm someone. Television is not evil or the computer is not evil unless you use it in an improper way. In fact, all those things can be a blessing. Sex is not evil unless it's used improperly. It's a blessing. There's a lot of examples we could give. The Torah is a blessing to those that obey it. It brings a blessing. But you violate it, it brings a death penalty. The law of gravity is not a curse until you jump off a cliff or off a high building and then see what happens when you hit the ground. The law of gravity keeps us from floating off into outer space. It keeps our feet planted on the ground. It's a blessing. 
A fence around a sheep pasture is not a curse. It keeps the predators out. And it keeps the sheep from wandering off and going into a, you know, going, getting lost and getting hurt. A guardrail on the side of a road and lines on the side, in the middle on the side, help keep you on the, on the road so you don't go off that cliff or into the ditch when you're going around the corner. These speed laws out here on the streets are not a curse. Unless you go too fast and you run into somebody, or unless you go too fast and you get stopped by a police officer and you gotta pay a price. They're there for our safety. Get the point? So where we get the idea that, well, the law is a curse and they're there for, let's throw it all out. That is utter nonsense. The people that are saying that are the same ones that say, pay your tithes to me, to the pastor, and they pass the plate. Oh, that's from the law. Same ones are saying, don't murder, don't steal, don't commit adultery, don't take God's name in vain, even though God isn't his name. It's Elohim, or Yudevah, Yehovah, or whatever. You know, they're the same ones that will say that. But then, when it comes to the Sabbath, or the dietary laws, or the feasts, and a few other things, oh, we don't want to come under the law. We can't do those things. Do you, you, you see the, the hypocrisy and the, the irrationality of it? And yet this is what the Christian church has been teaching, the mainstream Christian church has been teaching since the early church fathers in the second century. And that's why our eyes are being opened. And we don't condemn it. We've all been there. By His grace, He's opened up our eyes. But I'm trying to show you the fallacy. I'm not trying to... I'm just laying out the truth and not trying to put anybody down. But they're gonna, the truth is going to put them down. The truth itself will judge everybody. And, and so this is what, you know, there's nothing in here that he's doing away with the Torah. As I said, if one merely violates one commandment, the curse of death has come on him. As Ezekiel says in chapter 18, the soul that sinneth it shall die. As Paul says in Romans, the wages of sin is death. As James says in James 2.10, if you break one, you've broken them all. Does that mean you should just ignore them and go out and break them all? No. We're going to nail some more nails into the hand of Yeshua, who's hanging on the cross, paying the penalty for our sins? That's, that's utter nonsense. Verse 13, Galatians 3. Christ, or Messiah, has redeemed us from the curse of law, having become a curse for us, Curses everyone who hangs on a tree. So, because he was the only one who did not break the Torah, did not violate the Torah, did not sin once, and because he's the one that made us, he's our creator, his life, he can redeem not only himself, because, well, he didn't need redeeming, but he could pay the price for everybody because he made us. And the Creator is always more valuable than all that He creates. That's why His life, that's why He could redeem us, and why His life was worth more than everybody. That's why He had to be the Creator. As I've said before, if I own a factory, I build a factory, and I own a factory that makes widgets, I, as the owner of the factory and the builder of those widgets, I am more valuable than the widgets. Yeah, my life is more than that which I have created. The same is with Yeshua. Galatians 3.17. Let's read this one. And this I say, that the law which was 430 years later cannot annul the covenant that was confirmed before by Elohim and Messiah, that it should make the promise of no effect. So how many of you have heard it? See, the law of Moses came 430 years later. It was a temporary law. It came 430 years after the time of Abraham. So it was added. Well, my Bible tells me that Abraham kept the Torah in two different places. My Bible tells me, in fact, you can find all the Ten Commandments all before uh, the law of Moses was given. So what was added? This is one I've puzzled over and gone back and forth over the years. 
and I think I finally have clarity on it. There's several things that were added. The Mosaic or Sinaitic covenant, as in Sinai, with the written Torah in codified form, forming his framework, in no way superseded the covenant Yovah made with Abraham. These two covenants, the Abrahamic and the Mosaic, are not conflicting but complementary to each other and in truth are indivisible. They're inseparable. They need each other. They cannot stand alone. The Abrahamic covenant, as Paul says in Romans 4, tells us how to get saved. And now that we're saved, the Mosaic covenant tells us how to walk in righteousness, if you will, how to stay saved, how to love Elohim with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, how to love Yeshua by keeping His commandments, and how to love our neighbors ourselves. Does that bother anybody? Sorry, it's the truth of the Bible. That's the bottom line. You can't have one without the other. The, Abraham, the Mosaic covenant does not tell us how to get saved. That's the Abrahamic covenant. But once we are saved, how now do we walk? What do we do? Now that we have right standing with Elohim, let's not go back to Babylon and become a heathen again. Let's go forward. The Mosaic, Abrahamic covenant shows man how to enter into a spiritual relationship with Elohim by faith, or by grace through faith, while the Mosaic or Sinaitic covenant shows man how to stay in right relationship with Elohim once we have gotten saved. This is really very simple. I don't know why these things are made so complicated. I do know. I understand. I started studying the Galatians about 45 years ago when I was like 12 or 13. It's taken me a long time to get a handle on it. But now that I see it, it's, you know how it is when you understand something and you get the truth of it? Also like, whoa, I mean, it's like that's gone over my head all those years and now I get it? Of course that makes sense. And it's just like all the pieces of the puzzle fit in place with all the rest of the pieces of the puzzle and you have this picture and it fits in with the whole Bible. We don't have to cram it to fit and paint it to mats. Like pounding a square peg into a round hole. But that's exactly what Christian theology tries to do here. It doesn't fit. It doesn't fit with what Paul is saying. It doesn't fit with what the other apostles are saying. It doesn't fit with their lifestyles. It doesn't fit with what Yeshua is teaching. And it doesn't fit with the rest of the Bible. Going clear back to the very beginning. What I'm teaching you does. It's really very simple. Hallelujah. At least I hope it does. If I'm wrong, Yah, correct me. The church's ideas... The mainstream church's idea that the covenants of Elohim are antithetical or that the latter supplants the former or that the new covenant annuls and supplants them all is totally wrong. Paul disproves this in Romans when he proves from the Abrahamic covenant the salvation by grace, uh, that salvation is by grace through faith. And that goes on to demonstrate that salvation by faith resulting in grace in no way annuls the Torah covenant, but establishes, or in no way annuls the Torah. Remember uh, Romans 3.31. Do we make void the Torah through grace? Elohim or God forbid, or may it never be so, as some translators translate. And he makes several other statements like that as well. Now let's go... Read a little bit further, Galatians 3.19. What purpose then does the law, remember to say it was added, 430 years later, we just read that. What purpose does it serve, the law? It was added because of transgression, till the seed, capital S, that's Yeshua the Messiah, should come to whom the promise was made. So a lot of people will read this and say, well, you know, the Torah was until Moses, and after that, we don't need the Torah anymore. Which they're really saying, we can go out and commit adultery, we can fornicate, we can rape animals, we can rape each other, we can kidnap, we can get into witchcraft, we can do whatever we want, we can murder, steal, covet, worship idols, all of these things. That's really what they're saying. They make these false distinctions 
emphasize the word false, between moral and civil, between ceremonial law and all this stuff. That's a divide and conquer mentality. Those are false distinctions that are not justified in the Bible. There is no, the Bible talks, when it talks about the law, it talks about the Torah, the law. It doesn't say, well, you got a ceremonial law over here and the moral law over here and the civil law over here and this and that. These are distinctions. These are false dichotomies. And they like to say, well, see, the Sabbath was part of the ceremonial law and that went away with the, the priesthood and the, and the, and the uh, sacrificial system. Uh-uh. The Sabbath predated all of that. It goes back to the beginning, back to Genesis chapter 1. And he re Yah rested on the Sabbath day. Um, furthermore, when you understand what the true definition of law or Torah means, it means in Greek or Hebrew, it means teachings, instructions, or precepts. It's not just a series of do's and don'ts. It's, this is the mind and the will and the character of Elohim. And that obviously cannot be done away with. It's, it, Paul says in chapter, chapter 7 of Romans, it's spiritual. This is the very mind and character of Elohim. His Torah is a reflection of who he is and who he wants us to become. How can that be done away with? That's, that's, that's ridiculous. So what was added? The word added in Galatians 3.19 means to put together with. That's what it means in the Greek. The written Torah was a nation of... Okay, so here you have the Torah. It was passed on down. Yah, Yehovah's instructions and in righteousness. It was passed on to given to Mo, Abraham, I mean to Noah, and to Seth, and to Enoch, and to, and to Noah, and to Shem, and to... It, Moses, I mean to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob, and then passed on down to Moses. So they had this oral tradition. It, it was not written down. It was passed on from father to son, from one tzaddik, one righteous man to another. Well, when Yehovah brought Israel out of Egypt, they went from being slaves to becoming a nation. They were not a nation when they were in Egypt. They were a tribe. But he brought them out of Egypt in the wilderness. He formed them into a nation with laws, with a judicial system, with a religious system, with holidays, with all the things. And then he gave them, this is the border. This is the land of Canaan, the promised land, and here's the borders of it. So to have a nation, you have to have land with borders. You have to have a judiciary. You need to have a... You need to have laws, you need to have order, you need to have a way to take care of the poor, you have national holidays, you have a, re a religion, and that's what he gave them. And he wrote it down. He wrote it down in a codified form, just like the United States has the U.S. Constitution. The Torah was their constitution. It was finally, it has been an oral law that had been pa passed on down, and finally it was written. Moses wrote it down. It's in this Torah scroll here. It was given to Yehovah, or Yehovah gave it to Moses audibly. Words, part of it he wrote with his finger, and part of it he audibly gave it to him up on Mount Sinai, or when we go into the tabernacle under the glory cloud to receive instructions. And then Moses wrote it down. He was a stenographer. He wrote down what he heard. So the written Torah was the nation of Israel's legal or code or constitution and was written down. In fact, Galatians 3.10, it talks about, it says, as many as are the works of the law are under the curse for it is written so this is this one thing curses everyone who hangs in a tree in which all things are written in the book of the law this is the first time it was actually written down this is what they're talking about it was added or added to the oral tradition that already existed and it was written down and there were some other things that were added in there also the 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 sacrificial system and the Levitical system. Along with what we might call the eternal truths of Torah that have always existed. And this happened 430 years after Moses went into the promise, or went into, the, uh, went into Canaan.
So the Torah has all, which always existed, was written, was actually written down 400 years, 430 years after the covenant, Yovah's covenant with Abraham. Some, some, another place says 400 years. Here it says 430 years. It depends when you start your count. Scripture is not contradicting itself. I'm not going to get into that one, but it all depends when you count. So the Torah was added or put together with the covenant, the Abrahamic covenant about how we are saved. So here we have the Mosaic covenant added to the Torah covenant. That's why it says in Ephesians chapter 2, talking about, it says in times past you were Gentiles, Paul talking to the people in the church, without God and without hope, without Elohim, without hope, you were um, aliens from the covenants of promise. He's talking to New Testament believers. Well, I'm only under the New Covenant. No. We are in the transition period between the Old and New, new Covenant. Yes, we are under the New Covenant. But we're in a transition period. I'm not going to get into that. The book of Hebrews talks about that. But the point is, the New Covenant is built on the Mosaic, Abrahamic and Mosaic. The main difference, and this is where the book of Hebrews, and I wasn't going to talk about this, but I'll add it in there. This is where the book of Hebrews is very important. The book of Hebrews shows how Yeshua fulfilled the sacrificial system and the Levitical system. Those were temporary systems until Messiah was to come, as, or until the seed would come, which is exactly what it says here. They were temporary systems to guide us, now I'm really getting ahead, to Messiah. And I, I like to say this, the Levitical system and the sacrificial system is more in force and more relevant today than it ever was when they had all of those sacrifices and all that whole system. Let me explain it this way. It's like a rose. You got a rosebud. And when it opens up into its full flower, it is more a flower in a certain sense than it was when it was a tight rosebud. But it's still the same flower. Or we could look at it another way. The sacrificial system and the Levitical system was a temporary system that was put in place after the golden calf incident to point the people to Messiah. They needed a tutor. They needed a guardian, and Paul uses this terminology here. The, this added law was a guardian to bring us to Messiah. Does that mean it stopped at that point? Well, the Levitical system did, as far as the as far as as far as how it existed. We can get into what's going to happen in the millennium. I'm not going to go there at this point. That's tangential to this discussion. But the Melchizedek priesthood system existed, pre-existed, and that's what we're under right now. The priesthood of all believers, to quote Lutheran, uh, Luther. But um, look at it this way. You're driving down the road and you come to a sign that says Portland, 50 miles. Do you stop your car and say, hey, I'll, hey, honey, let's pull over. We, we've arrived at Portland. And you get down and go sit underneath that, that highway sign and say, hey, it's sure nice to be here in Portland. And you're sitting under this, looking up at the, uh, the highway sign that says Portland, 50 miles. No. You keep on going until you reach your destination. That's exactly what the Levitical and sacrificial systems were. They were street signs, prophetic shadow pictures, as one person likes to call it that point to the full reality of Messiah. They were just temporary things that pointed to Him. And when we get to Him, we don't need to go back to the sign. But that's the sacrificial Levitical system. That's not all the rest of the Torah that tells us how to walk. That doesn't mean that, oh, now that we come to Messiah, we can murder, steal, commit adultery, break the Sabbath, eat swine's flesh, rape, steal, all that kind of thing. You see what I mean? These are the defined distinctions we need to make when we read what read Paul in Galatians. Hallelujah. I think I already covered that. Because of the sin, I'll read from my notes here. Because of the sin, that is the sin of the golden calf, Yovah also gave the Israelites 
as part of, part of the Sinaitic Torah covenant, the Levitical priesthood and sacrificial system. When they sinned at the golden calf, Yehovah had already given them his Torah at Mount Sinai. This, didn't, this still didn't prevent them from sinning. So Yehovah gave them the priesthood and the sacrificial system that would help to guide them in the paths of righteousness. Look, they already had a priesthood system before the Levitical priesthood system came along. They had a priesthood system. That priesthood system was the head of each family was to be the priest of his home, just like the patriarchs were. But, but, they failed. They did not instruct their children, and they went a whoring after the golden calf, and that system failed. So that's why he raised up. We'll get to you in a minute. You can. Oh, okay, okay, great. Very good. I don't blame you. Anybody needs to stand up, it's okay. We're almost, we're, literally, I'm almost done here. Hallelujah. Well, you might be saying hallelujah. I'm saying hallelujah too. So we're all saying hallelujah together. It's a hot day, and we're just about done here. Hallelujah, Mark. Thank you. That encouraged me. That encouraged me to preach for another hour. No, just kidding. Just kidding. Just kidding. This, this is uh, what I've been chewing the gut on all week long. So Hallelujah. Well, maybe you can. Maybe you can. That's great. Yeah, we need to chew. That's meditating. And 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 I I hope that you have some insights that you can add. Add some insights because maybe I'll learn something too. We all learn from each other. So I got just a little bit more to read here and we're finished. So Yovah gave them the priesthood and sacrificial system that would help to guide them in the paths of righteousness to help prevent them from wandering off again into the heinous sin of idolatry. Eventually the sacrificial and Levitical system pointed them to Yeshua the Messiah who would redeem them once and for all from the power and consequences of sin. This is why Paul introduces the concept of the Messiah's seed. He mentions it in chapter Galatians 3, 16, and, and, and again in verse 19. And a mediator in verse 20. The Torah law was a tutor, and that's a real bad translation. Um, that's really not what it is. It's a, it's a, it's a, a pedagogue that, that it actually, more accurately should be a guide to bring us to Messiah. What mainstream Christian teachers tend to ignore is that the Torah bringing us to the Messiah is only one of the Torah's purposes. I have heard people preach, oh, now that the Torah brought us to Messiah, we don't need the Torah anymore. You mean it's all right to go out and murder, steal, commit adultery, lie, covet, and all that stuff? Don't think so. We still need it. The, the Torah is, the, is, is only one of the purposes it's only one of the pur the Torah. One of the only one of the purposes of the Torah is to bring us to Messiah. It's not the only one. I've come up with about twelve. I don't remember exactly, but there are about twelve purposes that the Torah serves. It's not only to bring us to the Messiah, but it's also once we get to the Messiah, how now do we walk? How do we keep from sinning? Well, the Torah doesn't keep us from sinning. It just shows us the right way to go. It's the Ruach HaKodesh, the Spirit of Elohim in us and our own desire and coming together like as fellowship in fellowship and all those dynamics that help us to um, you know walk in righteousness, accountability and those kinds of things. But mostly the work of the Spirit. And let me just add this one. That's the primary difference between the New Covenant. The New Covenant includes the provisions of the all the provisions of the Abrahamic Covenant and it, it includes also the Mosaic Covenant, but with the Levitical and sacrificial systems brought to the higher level and fulfilled or brought to its plurao, that's what fulfilled is, brought to its fuller expansive unit, spirit and truth and Yeshua being the full flower of it or the end of the law, as Romans 10 verse 4 says, which is a terrible uh, translation is it's the Greek word teleo which means he's the end result the goal the final goal of it that's what that's what we that's what this is all about this is what Paul is teaching the rose of Sharon hallelujah so we see that um, 
the law not only points out sin and the sacrificial system showed Israel their need for a once and all redeemer but in numerous places both Yeshua and the apostolic writers show us the Torah is essential in the life of the redeemed believer to guide us in the paths of righteousness from the point of our acceptance of Yeshua and onward till we receive our resurrected bodies moreover Yeshua clearly states in several places that the eternal and heavenly rewards of the saints are based on one's Torah works. That's another benefit of the Torah. It shows us how to become greatest in the kingdom. I mean, it, it does in part. It has to do with our relationship with Yeshua. But if we love him, we'll keep his commandments. That's Matthew 5, 19. One can't throw the Torah into the trash can and expect to have a high reward in the kingdom of Elohim. In fact, if you toss out the Torah, you may not even end up there. And with that, I will conclude, and I'm out of breath. We'll stay tuned for part two of this teaching next week, where we will go and finish it up with Galatians 4, uh, a quick analysis of Galatians 4, 1 through, uh, chapter 4 through 16. And this isn't bad. I did this all in a minute and 16 seconds. So uh, a minute and, I'm sorry, a minute that was fast. An hour and 16 minutes. There we go. <laughs> no wonder I'm out of breath. Anyway, thank you for listening. And again, these notes are online. All of my notes. And if this went by really quickly, you need to chew on it and, and get into it and go through them and see for yourself. Study it out. Go line by line with your Bible open. I encourage you to do that. Amen. All right. Hallelujah. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon his name. He is near, he is near, he is near. Yeshu Hashem Behim Atzov Kerabu Oh